Hello, I'm Lucas Horrox and welcome to my Dacia faction guide for Rome Total War. Today we're going to be having a look at the Dacian units, the buildings and also the campaign strategy for the Imperial campaign as playing as Dacia. So Dacia is a traditionally non-playable faction, so you have to unlock it using the data files, but it's the starting position is a region sort of around here, and we'll see it in a second in more detail, but it's the region where I'm pointing my arrow. They start off with two settlements, and they are of course a barbarian faction. They're described as barbarian close combat infantry, including forksmen, but very little cavalry. Now, to my mind, Dacia is one of the hardest campaigns in Rome Total War. Uh, it's up there with the likes of Numidia and the Seleucids, in my opinion. I think the Dacian campaign is probably the hardest barbarian campaign, or one of the hardest, just because the units just they aren't that impressive. And that is exactly what we're going to have a look at right now. Alright, so these are the Dacian units. And as you can see, I mean, there are some decent units here. We'll have a look at them in a second. First of all, Barbarian Peasants. Yeah, they're just peasants. There's nothing particularly special about them. Next up, Warband. This is the standard, sort of the first unit everyone uses as a Barbarian faction. They're okay. I find their morale is pretty poor. But they're relatively numerous. 121 in a unit. Decent defence and attack, it's nothing particularly special, they're quite disorganised, but they'll do as a starting unit when you just got to pump out troops to take settlements early on. Next up, na Naked Fanatics. Now Spain, I remember, definitely gets these as well. They're good in the old attack, but the defence suffers a little bit because they are literally shirtless, like the Warband for example. But the good morale, they are fanatical fighters, so the, the good morale and the good stamina means that they will fight for a long time without breaking, but they do charge their orders. Because again, these are un unorganised barbarians. This is the Dacian army. They are unorganised or disorganised. The Falksmen are a slight step up. They don't have the morale bonus, which is a shame, but they have a good defence, better defence anyway, an okay attack. And yet, yeah, these guys are relatively similar. They're fast moving. Again, no armor though. This is where the Chosen Swordsmen come in. The, the Chosen Swordsmen are a big step up. And once you get these guys, this is when Dacia starts to. The campaign starts to get a bit easier at this point. Definitely with these guys at the beginning, you have to be careful. But these guys, they, are, they have an excellent morale, which is great. And they're well armored as well, which makes a nice change from the shirtless guys that you see over here. Even the Barbarian Peasants have got a shirt, it's weird. But anyway, yeah, so well armoured, good stamina, 13 attack, 17 defence is a lot higher. So the attack is the same as the Falksman, but the defence is way higher, which you will feel the benefit of in battle, most certainly. Next up, the Archer Warbands, nothing particularly special, basic archers, they haven't got the longest range ever, but a missile attack of 7 is okay. You don't want to be fighting in the melee though, they're pretty useless in that respect. But the Chosen Archer Warband are pretty decent in the melee. 10 attack and defend, 10 defense with a charge bonus of 4. They have long range missiles and they have good morale which is rare for archers. So these guys are pretty damn good. The missile attack is 8 so it's not that much better than the Archer Warband. But the fact they have longer range means that they're so much more dangerous on the battlefield. So again with the archers as well at the beginning nothing special. But once you move up to the Chosen Archers then... Actually, they're pretty damn good, especially for barbarians. So, yeah, the Chosen Archer Warband definitely would recommend. Warhounds, nothing particularly special. I kind of use them just to scare certain troops, but Warhounds aren't, they haven't got a particularly great use. They're alright at chasing down enemies as well if they're fleeing, because they're very fast moving, of course. But next up, the cavalry. And the game's a bit harsh when it says very little cavalry, because there is some cavalry. The barbarian cavalry is the basic cavalry, obviously. Attack of 8, defense of 10. But again, they may charge without orders, they're a little bit disorganised, and I, their morale isn't brilliant. I've used them before and they can break. Really what I'd use them for is that charge bonus, so if you have a unit that's pinned to another unit, then just get them to slam into the side or the rear of them, and they'll probably break. But I wouldn't use them in a sort of long slugging match, that's not what, they, that's not what they're designed for. The Barbarian Noble Cavalry, however, is a step up. Good morale, which means they're better at a sort of slugging match if that's what you want to use them for. Although I don't like using cavalry for that purpose anyway. But also the the defense of 15 complements that as well, and the better attack means that they are just all round better troops. Next up, the barbarian warlord. This is the general of the Dacian faction. Attack of 12, defense 13, 
excellent morale. Of course, the general's unit is going to be good, but the step up, the post Marion general, is has better defence, obviously. Also has excellent morale. There isn't a huge amount of difference, honestly, between the post and pre Marion uh, generals, but this is obviously a step up. They've got a better defence. Is the is the impetus? Is the emphasis? Basically, now as for a barbarian faction, Dacia have ballistas, which I think is relatively rare. I don't see many barbarian factions with ballistas, but there we go. So yeah, they're used to take buildings down. I don't really use them. I just use onagers if I'm going to use siege equipment, just because they tend to do the job a bit better. But again, don't bother using them against troops because these are probably more accurate than the onagers. And then last up, Scythian mercenaries. Slightly odd that you can get Scythian mercenaries as Dacia. I use them a lot in my Scythian campaign, they are terrible in the melee, I can assure you of that, but they are fast moving and as long as you're good at skirmishing, they are very very effective. If if you use them right, if you use them correctly, they can take down a large amount of troops without being hit at all. So you can win battles when you're seriously under provisioned because of the Scythian mercenaries and that's the case pretty much for all horse archers in reality. So next up we're going to be having a look at the campaign map and the buildings that you can use as the Dacian faction. First up however we're going to be looking at the video for Dacia, it's a generic rebel video as far as I can tell because the Total War game never made an introduction for Dacia specifically. Before my grandfather's grandfather was born, this was our land. These are good places. Our gods live here, in the trees and rivers. They watch over us. We are happy. We hunt. We love. We have families, homes, a good life. But sometimes we must fight. The Romans disturb the gods. They burn the forests. They take what is ours, wives, children, land. And the Romans talk of how they will help us and protect us. They put us to sleep with golden promises. When we wake, all we had is gone, stolen. They take our sons and turn them into little Romans. Ah! So we fight to keep what is ours. What must stay ours? There can be no peace. No peace with Romans, men of stone and iron and lies. There can be only war. Alright, so this is the starting position for Dacia. Now, as I said, they start off with two settlements, Porolusum, which is the capital, and Campus Lazages. Um, my pronunciation isn't brilliant. But anyway, these two settlements are very, very basic, and honestly, they're not going to do. You need to start expanding. But the question is, where, in what direction do you start expanding? Well, I'm going to uh, turn off the Fog of War, just so I can show you what's around. Obviously, I wouldn't normally play the game like that, but just so I can show you where everything is, because... You can't really see otherwise without the, the fog of war. So I'll just change that quickly and then we can see. So basic, long story short, there's a lot of rebel settlements up north and some people will probably make the mistake of thinking, well, I can get these two settlements easily, I'll expand up north and then, you know, it's not worth it. It's not worth expanding up north and it's not worth expanding into Dacian territory. I wouldn't even recommend that much expanding in this direction at the beginning, but I possibly would a little bit. I'll talk about that in a second. My first move, though, however, would be to take down the Thracians. Now, I've played as Dacia before on the very hard, very hard difficulty, and it's vital you take out the Thracians early. Now, you can do this early on. You, I would go probably first for Campus Getai, and then go for Tylus. But I would personally put all my resources into that, because you don't want the Thracians expanding into Byzantium, and then they're just going to get a bit stronger, and they'll probably take a few Scythian territories. They're annoying factions to deal with. So if you take them out early on, you've got good territory with a border to the Black Sea, and they're therefore Mediterranean. But also you've got rid of a rival straight away. So that's a, that's a something I'd go for straight away. Now, on the other flank, yes, there are some nice easy settlements to get. Aquincum is a nice easy one to get. Lovacy is a good one as well. But bear in mind, the Germanians will probably be going for these as well. 
they will probably go for these two settlements first. So you will have first pick at Lovacy and Aquincum, which is good. And I wouldn't bother going for these. The Scythians and the Germanians can fight over that. But I wouldn't expand too much in this direction because you, they're not very good settlements, firstly, and they're very thinly spread. So if the Brutii, or potentially Julii, but more likely the Br Brutii, come along, they're going to destroy you. Really, first of all, take the Thracian territory, and then I would take the territory off Macedonia. This is where the, your profit is. You're not going to make any profit from Porolissum, Campus Lazages, Aquincum, Uvivum, Lovacy. You're not going to make any profit, or very little. The money is in Greece, particularly Corinth, Athens, Sparta, Thermon, Larissa. These settlements are the ones that are going to make you money, so you want to expand there and get them before the Brutii does. Then the Brutii will probably go for settlements like Salona, Segestica, the ones I just mentioned, and they're going to be economically inferior to you, at which point then you can take the Brutii on. But you need to get to these systems before the Brutii. Now as for the Scythians, don't make the mistake I did when I played this and go to war the Scythians. They're an annoying faction to deal with for so many reasons. One, they have a, such a huge expanse of land, it's just ridiculous trying to conquer it all. It's not even good land, like it, this is just barren wasteland <laughs> really, it's not, you know, it's not worth taking for economic or military reasons. And also, the Scythians are an annoying faction to fight against. They've got a lot of horse archers, which are difficult to defend against, difficult to get to. There's no point. You could possibly go for Chersonesos, but again, you're just inviting Scythians to attack you. If anything, just form an alliance with the Scythians, and if you're really lucky, you could form an alliance with the Germanians as well. That secures your northern flank, meaning you could focus more on the Macedonians and the Greeks down here. And then later on, of course, the Brutii. But anyway, that's what I would recommend. But finally, we're going to have a look at the buildings available for the Dacians. And it's nothing hugely exciting, I'll admit, but they do have some unique buildings. So, the basic barbarian buildings, we, you know, we're used to seeing these by now. Nothing particularly special. The unique buildings are, of course, the temples. And there are three temples. Hebelisis, Bendis, and Zalmoxis. Hopefully the pronunciation wasn't too bad. We're going to have a look at the sacred circles because that's the highest level, the level 3. Just to show you how good these religions can get. So first of all, Hebelisis. Um, public order bonus of 15% is pretty decent. But the morale bonus the troops trained here, plus 2, is very, very good. That's quite a high morale bonus. So definitely worth it if you're going to train troops in the area. If you're going to use it as a, mil if you're going to use a city or a town as a military outpost or something like that. A military recruitment center then Habelisis definitely because look at that plus two morale bonuses and morale is such a big thing in this game so that's really good now Bendis is more for the growth of a city the public order bonus is the same but the improved farms and food production plus three honestly more useful in the early game rather than the later game but certainly is useful if you if you want to grow a city yeah Bendis is a great place great religion rather and then finally Zalmoxis it's a more sort of all-round military one. 15%, they're all 15% happiness. Light, heavy weapons and armour, plus one upgrade if you retrain the troops there. So that just means the troops will be better provisioned. So if you, let's say you have an area where you're recruiting a lot of troops from. If you have Zalmoxis and Hebelisis very close to each other, you can get the morale bonus and then retrain them in the town of the Zalmoxis circle. And then they've got good weapons and armour as well. At, at which point... Let's say later on in the game, if you put them on Chosen Swordsman or something like that, they're definitely going to be able to compete with the top Roman tiers if they haven't got experience. So, you know, if, especially when you're fighting the Romans, it's difficult with the Dacians, but with the combination of those two religions, you can certainly make some very, very strong troops, which is a good thing. So that's basically what I would recommend for Dacia. But the last thing I'd sort of like to mention is their economy is pretty bad. So beware of the economy. Now, there's two ways to play it. You could say, oh, we'll just spend, uh, save and hope it doesn't go too much into the red. Or you could spend and invest in, I don't know, farming or roads or markets. That's what I'd recommend, by the way. Sort of as a final note, really. But yeah, thank you very much for watching. I'll be back very soon with more Scythian and mercenary-only challenge videos. And I have some ideas in the future of various mods and other things I can use as well. So keep an eye out for that. But otherwise, thank you very much, and I'll see you around.